Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Tuesday, September 7th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. We're talking Royals today with beat writer Lynn Worthy and columnist Sam Mellinger, and with you. On the list of topics, what should the Royals' objectives be for the remainder of the season? How should they use Alberto Mondesi now that he's back? And why do baseball metrics and national media seem to hate Salvador Perez? We're only half kidding on that one, but some advanced metrics make little sense to me. Hey, this show started as a Sports Beat Live, so let's get going talking Royals baseball. Hey, good morning from Kansas City, and welcome to Sports Beat Live. It's our weekly dive into Royals baseball with the star folks who know them best. And with you, please send us your questions and comments and talk Royals with us. Uh, Before we get started, a big thanks to our sponsor, the University of Kansas Health System. You will hear from them later in the show. I hope everybody had a great Labor Day weekend. Uh, It's always a busy weekend in sports, uh, but I'm I'm hoping that our our guys here, Lynn Worthy and Sam Mellinger, had a few hours to enjoy themselves over Labor Day. Sam, uh, any grilling at the Mellinger Estates this weekend? Yeah, as as it happens, it was the neighborhood barbecue uh, on Saturday. So, um, yeah, first place ribs, no big deal. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, and, and what uh, and what was the secret that took it to the top? Just do what I do. I'm just trying to be the best me that I can be. <laughs> Good to hear. Good to hear. And Lynn, I know your Labor Day weekend was filled with baseball, <laughs> covering covering baseball again. Labor Day weekend is busy for for everybody. I did like having an, an afternoon game on on Monday. Um, so and and because it was in Baltimore, early start for uh, the Royals on on uh, on Monday, beating the Baltimore Orioles in what I think is a very kind of a typical Royals game when the Royals are good. And they have been good in the last decade or so. They've done it with, you know, enough starting pitching, a good bullpen, and good outfield defense. And speaking of outfield defense, uh, here's where the game turned on Monday. Two blown lead losses. Left field. Benintendi is there. And that is knowing this ballpark, having played so many games in Baltimore as a member of the Red Sox, you could tell he knew exactly where he was and what he needed to do. Oh, and thankfully he was able to drift and glide towards center field on that wall. I think that hits the top of the wall and goes over. Might have saved the game right here. Look at his group. Looks once. Knows where he is. And that was robbed a homer. Oh, fantastic highlight catch. Benny, way to go. Scotty Barlow says, woo. I think Scotty Barlow may have said more than woo, but anyway, <laughs> uh, that kept the that kept the score three to two, and that was the final. So good day all around for the Royals. Really good day for Andrew Benatendi, who's been swinging uh, a good bat here lately. Uh, Lynn, what um, uh, what what about yesterday's W? It, you know, they're, they're playing a team that's – I don't know if it's the worst record in baseball, but certainly uh, the, at, at the bottom, a team that had lost 19 in a row just a little – you know, ended that streak just a little while ago, but went to New York and took two out of three from from the Yankees. It's um, And they've got, what, three more with Baltimore here the rest of the week. Yep, yep. And, um, you know – Almost as importantly, the game was played in a timely fashion that allowed me to get to my fantasy football draft. So that's, we always like that. I didn't have any grilling going on, but we had some numbers crunching. Um, but yeah, in Baltimore, a team that took two out of three in Kansas City, I think it was two out of three in Kansas City right after the All Star break. Um, I know they won the series. I, I'm forgetting exactly what the uh, numbers were, but a, a series that featured. Uh, the Royals losing in games that were started by Matt Harvey and Jorge Lopez by Baltimore. So, yeah, I remember that was uh, the source of some angst for Royals fans at the time coming out of the break. But, um, you know, it brings me back to, uh, I think it was on Sunday, uh, Sal Perez talking about 
how the, I asked about them playing well against Chicago because last year that was a big thing in the shortened season. They went one and nine against Chicago. And if they just played 500 against Chicago, they would have been 500 in the shortened season. And they felt like they just didn't play well against Chicago in any of those games. Um, and Sal's answer was, you know, it doesn't matter who the team is. It's about them playing at a consistent level and, and, and playing well and playing the way they should every day. And and he said, even, you know, after that series, coming out playing the same way in the next series, um, that obviously being this one against Baltimore. So, yeah, it's um, it was, I guess, encouraging in that they didn't play particularly well for, you know, the first eight innings or seven innings. And then they, you know, put together a rally just to take the lead in the, in the eighth and hold on for the win. Yeah, so and with um, with with Sunday's win, the Royals took the season series from the White Sox, right? Ten uh, ten out of nineteen, and of course this year's uh, this uh, the, last year's White Sox or this year's Cleveland Indians, uh, they cannot beat they cannot beat Cleveland. So what next year it'll be the Twins or the Tigers, I guess that they'll uh, <laughs> they'll they'll stumble against all all season. But that is kind of encouraging, isn't it, Sam? That the that the Royals. That's the, the Royals trot the record out every time they 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 play a first place team. They have more wins against against first place teams than anybody in baseball this year. But that means means a couple things. First, means the Royals aren't in first place because teams that are in first place uh, don't get to play themselves. But uh, uh, but the Royals are. Uh, I think it's twenty wins against first place teams, with half of them coming against the White Sox. So not not a bad stat. I think it's really encouraging. And and the thing, I get what Sal's saying about, um, you know, it, it depends more on how the Royals are playing. You know, that, that should be his focus. It is his focus. But um, last year, it, it looked like the White Sox and Royals were just playing different sports. You know, I mean, it, it was just, oh, my God, like <laughs> the Royals just weren't even close. And, you know, to have that turnaround in a year, um, I think it is important. Now, what Sal said is, is, is also correct because the problem with the Royals, I mean, they would be sort of within, you know, looking distance or whatever of, of a playoff spot right now, if they just didn't have so many losing streaks, you know, um, like lose three in a row and then win the fourth, you know, and, and the season I think would, uh, would feel a lot differently. So, um, you know, it's, it's the story of the Royals in so many ways, right? Like um, I think they are making progress. And, and I think that, it matters that, you know, they have, you know, at least according to, I think it was Baseball America, the third best farm system. And I think it matters that Daniel Lynch has performed the way that he has, uh, you know, after that disastrous start. And Carlos Hernandez, like, I think all of this stuff matters. And I actually think they're, I don't know if I'm just being naive or whatever, but I, I think they put themselves in really good position for next season. And in, in Lynch, who, who really didn't throw well his last game, right, ended up with a blister, um, and Hernandez, maybe they've got the type of starters that you can roll out to prevent that, you know, 7 yeah. to 11 game losing streak uh, that has just crushed this team over the last few years. And they've got multiple, you know, I mean, they're starting to get, I don't want to say that they've got depth, but they're starting to get to the point where you have, you know, enough guys where it's not okay. You got one or two guys and then you're waiting to see what happens with the others. Like that now you've got at least a number of guys. You say, okay, you feel somewhat comfortable pulling from this group and trying to get five. You still want more. You always want more. I mean, I think we're, um, a couple of us were having a conversation in the press box this week or this weekend. And somebody said something about, yeah, well, what are they going to do with this guy? And that guy was like, it's baseball. Like it, it doesn't matter. It's like it's like oh, but they got like seven guys. Like no, no. <laughs> it looks like they got seven guys, but no. It, it, it's always at the beginning of the season. Or you know, oh, well, they got too many. No, nope, never been a season where you've had too many. So, um, but they're at least getting to the point now where I mean, because you think about right now, Brad Keller's you know on the IL. You're probably not going to see him again this season. He's so he's not part of this group that you're watching right now. Um, you just and, you're, and they've been going with you know a six man rotation. So I mean, there's at least some numbers there that are encouraging as far as the number of starting pitchers. When you think back to the pandemic season, <laughs> where you know they had they started off that season where you had multiple bullpen games the first time around the rotation. So yeah, there's there's some progress there. It is wild. I mean, there was a point this season just 
what was it a couple months ago, Lynn? They they basically had a three man rotation, um, you know, and and now they've got a surplus. I mean, I just the that Orioles series that that we you were you were just referencing that that may have been, and I understand all the losing streaks, so maybe this is not true, but I, that may have been the low point of the season, you know, losing a series to that team and then coming out of the all-star break and being TBA on a starter for like the Saturday or Sunday game. It was just like, God, what a mess, you know? And then, you know, the stuff changes pretty quick. So, uh, but you're right. Like no team has ever had too many starting pitchers like ever <laughs> you know, like that has never happened in the history of baseball and, and the Royals aren't going to be the first because um, those guys break, you know, they, they get demoted, whatever. Um, you know, if you've got seven, maybe you won eight, you know? Well, one of the encouraging signs recently was, uh, it was the performance of Jackson Kowar in uh, on, uh, was it uh, when he, one of the Cleveland games. Right. And I think we had just finished talking last week when the Royals, uh, expanded the roster to include Coar and uh, and Alberto Mondesi. So uh, Coar, at least in his first appearance in the second part of his you know, major league debut season, threw a um, you know six innings, six strikeouts, uh, left the game with a three to two lead, and the Royals couldn't hold it because they were of course playing Cleveland. And uh, that's that's just you know they they do not beat Cleveland this year, but anyway it looks like at least for for one game and I think he throws tonight if I'm not mistaken Coar is at least for one game followed the Daniel Lynch path back to uh, to the major leagues didn't he Lynn? Yeah, in terms of just having a, a lot better performance and it was it's it's interesting to me because you know Lynch you could point to tipping pitches and, and, and say, okay, well, this is what's what his major issue was. And he still had, you know, like that first start, um, he gave, he got a couple, I think, I think four innings into his very first start, but then the other two, the, the, the pitching, uh, tipping pitches was the, the more the issue. But Coar, it seemed like just never got comfortable, never settled in. He had uh, I think he had three appearances the first time he was up. One of them was in relief, and I think the relief one was the longest one. And he had a total of, I want to say, five innings pitched in three appearances, two of them starts. And so, and it wasn't necessarily like, a, oh, well, they know what's coming. It was like, no, it's just, it's not going well. Like it was, it was, he couldn't command. And then he was leaving balls all over the middle that were getting hit hard. And then it was just like, uh, they tried to put him in the pen. He had one inning. I remember he had like a one, two, three inning, or he had one solid inning out of the pen. They brought him out for a second inning, and it was like, yeah, that went a little sideways. So it was, it was different from Lynch in that Lynch, you knew what was going on, and you say, okay, well, they got to fix this. And with um, you know Coar, it was just like, is this too much for him right now? Because it, it looked like it at points, and then you see him come back, and it's like, okay, well, this is what everybody was talking about, and why everybody was like, you know after the first time he struggled, you start saying, well, was he just not ready? And people point to his performance before and say, well, how much more ready do you get? This is what they were talking about. I remember a start in Oakland for, for Coar where he just couldn't get an out. I mean, it was just, it was terrible. And, and all the highlights you'd seen of him in Omaha was, you know, he just did a great job keeping the ball down and he, he gets to the major leagues and he, and he, he, he he can't locate his fastball, and you wonder how does how did it change so much from from Triple A to the majors, just in terms of of location. I mean, the mound size is the same. Why, why can't he? You know, why can't he keep the ball down in the majors? For, for whatever whatever reason, it just wasn't working for him. Royal sent him back, um, and again, just uh, one game's worth of uh, evidence, but a, a good good outing for him and. And he goes. I, be, I believe it is tonight against uh, against the Orioles. So uh, here's hoping that uh, we, we see more success from Jackson Coar. And listen, you know the Royals since the All Star break, including that two out of three uh, uh, gaff against the Orioles at Kaufman coming out of the break. The, the Royals are 26 and 22 since the All Star break. And I don't know where that ranks in in, in the majors, but. You know, upper half, right? It's got to, it's got to be. And I would love to see him finish with a five, you know, better than 500 record uh, throughout the rest of the way 
from uh, in the in the post All Star break part of the season. I'd like to see him finish 500 or better at home. Mm-hmm. They're one mm-hmm. game under 500 at home this year, but that's not what the rest of the year needs to be about, is it? I mean, they to me right now it's it's all about well, there's some nice totals to be had by 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 Salvador Perez and others, but. It's about the develop, development of the young pitching, right? With Bubich and Singer and Kowar and Lynch, um, it's, it really is about getting these guys more comfortable and going into 2022 with a little bit of, you know, a little, a little bit of confidence and some momentum. Am I right, Sam? Yeah, I think the scores <clears throat> do matter a little bit more, um, just because I. But I, I don't care whether they win 70 games this season or 76 or whatever. But I, I think the scores matter just in terms of confidence. And because um, I, I think that Mike Matheny is kind of like hinted at this a, a few different ways in a few different times. Like I, I, there's times where they can say what they want, but there's times that it doesn't it, it doesn't seem like they're confident. And I think that that's kind of where some of the losing streaks happen. I think that you see it um, more in the beginning of the season, which is a positive sign that you don't see it as much anymore. But when the other pitcher is shoving, it's it's hard for the Royals to get that guy off track. Uh, you know, I, I just think stuff like that matters if you're going into a season, which I, again, maybe I'm being naive, but um, I, I think it's spring training, opening day next season, I think this team is going to be sort of where a lot of people thought the the team was before this season. Um, you know, I, I think they're going to have a legit chance, expectation, whatever, of of playing meaningful baseball games all throughout the season. Um, you know, health, all that stuff, you don't know, but um, you know, and, and I think that August and September can be sort of a platform or a jumping off point, I, I should say, to to maybe get that way next season. So, Lynn, you were asked a question from Cody on on Twitter about um, when was the last time a Major League third baseman stole 60 bases in a year? (laughs) And the obvious reference is to Alberto Mondesi, who uh, in his uh, naturally in his first game back hits a home run and has stolen a couple of bags and has looked like, you know, a man among boys when he's on the base paths. I've twice I've seen him steal third base and he stops after he starts. And uh, I mean, I don't know what's going on with that hesitation, but, but then he goes in standing up. So he's the freak that we remember him being. And, um, and are we, are we there with him as a third baseman Are the Royals there with him as a third baseman, Lynn? For the rest of this season, that's where they are. Um, going forward, it remains to be seen. Um, and the Royals haven't wanted to really talk about potentially, you know, anywhere else. They just said, okay, third base, stay on that same side of the infield. Um, do this for now. Let Nicky stay at short because he's had such a good season. They feel like he's, you know, earned that right and that he is in uh, the mix for a gold glove. So they didn't want to shake things up. Him and Witt are playing so well together. Um, but going forward, Still remains to be seen. I mean, I know shortstop is a position that they would like to have an everyday type person. Um, and we've talked about it before. Dayton was pretty clear. They're not going to count on Mondesi to be that guy. And I think what we're seeing right now with the regular off days, like that's going to continue. I mean, I, I, I said that, you know, weeks ago when, when Dayton came out and talked about Mondesi, you can't count on him for hundred plus games every season. And at that point, it was pretty clear they were talking about some sort of a load management thing. That, not, that wasn't just for the rest of the season. I think that's going to be a thing going forward, at least for a while from on the sea. Um, but, uh, you know, and so he didn't, uh, he didn't hop on the zoom after that first game where he hit the home run, but he was out there on the field one of the days last week. And a couple of us talked to him, like, you know, we didn't even really, um, it wasn't a formal type thing. He just stopped and talked to us. And, um, he sounded like he was actually looking forward to the third base thing. Like we were wondering, like, you know, move off shortstop. And now this was for a short period of time too. So who knows, but um, he, he, he talked about how he was looking forward to trying something different. Um, when, when somebody asked about, you know, potentially would he be open to the outfield? He said, yeah, you know, he'd he probably want to do it in the off season and get some time, but yeah, that wouldn't, he wouldn't just like reject that out of hand. Um, and even on the stolen base thing, he's, he, it was, Funny, he said, yeah, 
I think he got almost too good of a jump because he was talking about, yeah, he thought that the guy still had a chance to throw over. That's why he stopped. <laughs> it's, it's like he, he realized that the, the guy could still throw over, like at that point when he started to break, and that's what the stop was. It wasn't like he was just trying to mess with guys. It was, you know, I think he almost got too good of a jump. So, um, But for the rest of this season, I think this is what we're going to see. But going forward, um, it's still yes to be determined, but the off days, are, I think, are going to be here for a while. I'd be surprised if they don't try him in the outfield. I'd be surprised if that's not part of the the exit interview um, a- after this season about, you know, hey, when you're working out or whatever, just do some shagging or, you know, just, you know, get used to that. Um, it just gives them more flexibility and, uh, you know, it gives him other options to get on the field. It, um, and I also believe, and maybe this would be true just with third base, but uh, – the, the precedent is there, and maybe it's just too convenient or whatever, but Alex Gordon stunk as a third baseman. And then they put him in left field, and he was the best left fielder in baseball over a span of about five years. And and I think that there was some mental just sort of unlocking and relaxation there. Um, and, and I don't think that Gordon and Mondesi are the same mentally. I think Gordon's kind of a white-knuckle guy, you know, like he's very intense and uh, – you know, failure really eats at him. I think Mondesi has more of that ball player, you know, sort of what you want, right. Of a little bit more easygoing, but, um, but I also think that Mondesi feels a lot of pressure, um, you know, in, in other ways personally. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe that can be, uh, you know, an aid to him as well. It's, it's a really good plan what they have, you know, I mean, I, I think that if you can get away from, you know, you, you've got to, <laughs> <laughs> grieve the idea of Mondesi as the 150 games a year shortstop. Like that's just not going to happen. And once you get past that, you see that the Royals have two guys that can play a really good big league shortstop even still. And and they can move Mondesi around, you know, to fill up, fill some gaps and injuries and slumps and, and all that. It's, I, I think it's a really good plan going forward, but I, I do expect at least corner outfield and maybe even center field, um, you know, to, to be on the table for him next year. Okay, and by the way, um, Cody asked a question about 60 bags in a year. Um, the, I, I looked it up before we went on the air. The, the record for career stolen bases by a third baseman is 231 by Howard Johnson of, of the Mets. Ojo. And, <laughs> Ojo. Um, so I think Montessi, if he's the third baseman in the future, will destroy that in about three or four seasons. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's take a break. And when we come back, Sam's going to tell us why the metrics and the national media hate Salvador Perez. <laughs> the Kansas City Royals lineup is backed up by the region's strongest team in healthcare, the University of Kansas Health System. We both suit up with one goal in mind, to win. The University of Kansas Health System, official health care provider of the Royals. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at 50 bucks, unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. All right, we're back with uh, Sam Ellinger and Lynn Worthy talking Royals on Sportsbeat Live. And okay, so we've talked about the Royals' three to two victory over the Orioles on on um, Monday afternoon, a game in which Salvador Perez drove in his hundred and third run of the season. That RBI total, I think, is. is Tops or matches the best in at least the American League right now, and his 41 home runs are right right there, second to Shohei Otani, 
he threw out a base uh, would-be base dealer yesterday. So I don't know what else Salvador Perez could have done to help the Royals win the game. And yet, and yet, his war, his wins above replacement, if he adds one point to it the rest of the season – will have the 18th or 19th best war for a season by a Royals player on his way to having an epic year. So what is it about the metrics, Sam, that uh, that don't seem to agree with Salvador Perez? Uh, well, on base is one, um, and but also uh, they don't like his defense. And, and I think I should say like the defensive metrics for first baseman and catchers, I think – are kind of garbage. Like it, it's just, it's, those are different posi- uh, positions. I think at first base, I don't think they do a good job of, of uh, taking into account like scoop, you know, saving throwing errors uh, by teammates, right. which I think is critically important for a first baseman and, and catcher. There's just so much involved. And I think those numbers don't really, I, I don't know that I buy into them all that much. The, the, the numbers hate him as a framer. Um, I think that's, that's certainly a big part of it. And I do believe that, you know, I think that's a measurable, thing and the Royals are aware of it and they say it's because he's big you know the umpire doesn't get a good view of it or whatever but um that's where it is it's it's on base and and they don't like his defense but I just think like I mean I love numbers you know the, those stats I think you can learn a lot and uh you know unlock a lot you know uh, of learning about the game and all that um, but I do think there's a time and place to you know just sort of see the game and see what happens and 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 watch how a guy changes a game and you know is with his teammates and all that stuff and and by that metric um you know i think salvador perez has a heck of a case to be second as high as second in the mvp vote no, nobody's getting first except for otani but you know after that i think he's got as good a case as anybody and there's some damn good seasons vlad guerrero and um uh, the the kid in Baltimore is having a great season too. Mullins, um, I mean, there, there, there's some really really great individual seasons, but I think Salvador Perez has a case to be, um, you know, second um, among among all of them. On base percentage, the guy, the guy walked, walked yesterday, yesterday. Uh, number, <laughs> number twenty two for the season, matching a career high. Yeah, well, where do you want from him, man? <laughs> I know. What do you think, Lynn? What is it about um, Salvador's game that um, I know that just doesn't add up? Uh, in, in the metrics department to uh well as sam mentioned the the pitch framing i think is the big one because his defensively for catchers um he ranks way down there i mean i think um actually cam gallagher is like one of the better ones in the majors i think he's like last i checked i think he was like a top 10 as far as pitch framing and sal was way down towards the bottom of that list um i don't think like sam said i don't think there's things that are there's things that aren't taking into consideration with defensively like you know blocking balls in the dirt which um i haven't looked in a couple of weeks but i know at one point salvi had more blocks like hundreds more blocks than any the next closest person um obviously his uh his ability to throw out runners picking guys off i mean we saw him with a walk off pick off this season so like those types of things there's not analytic the analytics don't really captures don't capture those quite as well um and yeah so i mean and it's funny too because I, I was trying to i i can't remember where it was so i can't exactly find it but i know baseball america i think within the last couple of weeks did one of those things where they surveyed baseball people and i can't remember if it was managers or gms but the top defensive catchers i think in the american league sal was voted either second or third amongst the baseball people whereas the metrics say he's like you know behind backup catchers and stuff like that so um i just couldn't i, I couldn't find it quick enough but i know i i had retweeted it, but they had one of those surveys in the american league I'm trying, i think it was like uh salvi um i think it might have been salvi maldonado and maybe um cleveland uh roberto perez i think were the the three in the american league but metrics are going to say what the metrics say um you know that's where the old uh with Merrifield, when those numbers say I can tell me I can't hit a slider, then I'll care about them. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And speaking of Witt, I bet that same survey had Witt as the best uh, base runner in the American League, as I recall as well. So, all right, Sam, and I got this from your Mellinger Minutes. Um, national media apparently hates Salvador <laughs> Perez, or at least ignores him anyway. Would, um, I, I think we're maybe a little sensitive in this part of the country to what the national media thinks of 
us in Kansas City, our teams. I kind of like it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I agree with your response. I kind of like it when the national media, when we think, you know, they, they treat us like the flyover country that yeah. we are. But I'm not, <laughs> right. we don't need ESPN here every day, yeah. you know, um, t- talking about Mahomes or, or Salvi or whatever. So um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I want to have a conversation sometime with, um, you know, people who work, who have our jobs in, you know, Minneapolis or Milwaukee or Cincinnati or wh- whatever. And just like, is it like that here, there, you know, like do people, it seems to me that people here care deeply and passionately and will, no, no matter what, will think that the national media is ignoring their teams. And then once Patrick Mahomes becomes the quarterback, and national media is always talking about him like it's just not positive enough. You know, now it's like, <laughs> why do you hate Patrick Mahomes? Because he said that he was like the best quarterback. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. But um, I think that there's a couple things with um, with Sal. I, look, first of all, MLB Network does set segments on Salvi. You know, ESP, like they're talking about him. But look, um, it's just a fact of life that if, if you play for the Yankees, Dodgers, Cubs, Red Sox. I mean, we know the teams. You're going to get, you know, more attention. Um, also, the Royals are in fourth place. <laughs> you know, like they're, that, that doesn't demand a lot of attention. Um, so I, I think that people are, and I think we're going to see it in the MVP voting. I really do. I think people recognize how good of a player he is. Uh, but if you're in a small market and the team's not winning, I don't think that, like that. That's just the way that uh, that the world works. I mean, the home run derby thing was ridiculous. I mean, that was like almost. It was like I was a waiting live skit. You know, I was waiting that, to drop in a Peter Alonso reference. I was waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> that was just, I mean, ab- like laughable. That, like an SNL skit about, you know, a small market team being ignored would look exactly like that. Like they wouldn't change a line. You know, so that that was just patently absurd. But, you know, for the most part, I mean, I, look, if the Royals, like I believe they are, if the Royals are going to start winning in the next few years or whatever, they'll get their attention, you know, um, and Salvi will be everybody's favorite. Yeah, I don't remember a lack of attention in 14 and 15 for that's right for the, for the Royals. So, all right, guys, great conversation. Uh, it was terrific to have uh, Lynn Worthy, Sam Mellinger here, Vahe Gregorianal. Be back next week. He is, as we say in the business, on assignment. And uh, Beth Welsh, our producer, thank you so much. Thanks to the University of Kansas Health System. We'll do this again next week, 10 a.m. on Tuesday, talking Royals with you. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our Sportsbeat KC production staff of Beth Welsh, Monty Davis, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. Tip of the cap to Lynn Worthy and Sam Mellinger for stopping by and talking Royals. Links to their stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, got another deal for you. You can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. Sports Pass is the online version of the Star Sports section. You get all the stories that appear in the print editions of the Star, plus additional stories that appear only on the website. And, of course, they're posted first on KansasCity.com. After three months, it auto-renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. And it's a great time to subscribe. Read about what's going on with the Chiefs, who open the regular season on Sunday against the Browns, the Royals, the colleges, the soccer teams, and more. How do you get it? Go to KansasCity.com slash SportsPass2020. That's KansasCity.com slash SportsPass2020. And I wanted to call your attention to something else new. Maybe you know about the Stars E-Edition. That's a replica of the printed newspaper on your screen that comes with your digital subscription. Now there's an updated sports section produced separately that goes along with it. When you open the E-Edition, there's a box in the upper right-hand corner. Click on that and you can access a sports page that includes all the evening news like the Royals and baseball games. I call it the Worthy Edition of the Star because it's worth your time and effort and because Lynn Worthy supplies about half of its content with his Royals reporting. Hey, however you get the Star, I want to thank you because you're supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Wednesday with another episode.